so I suspect we will have some more charters to move on relatively soon. Uh, but for today, we would like to take a final look at H207. <clears throat> Legislative Council, how may I help you? Mm -hmm. Shall I go through the bill one more time? I did jot down the questions that came up mm -hmm. March 27th, which was the last time mm -hmm. this was discussed. <coughs> and I can highlight the two outstanding points of discussion that remain. Would you like? That would be helpful. Let's, let's take a walk through the bill language since it's been a couple weeks. Okay. Uh, the charter amendments begin by adding a new section 1501, which covers the eligibility of non-citizen voters in local elections. Uh, the first section here uh, provides that any person may register to vote in Montpelier City elections who on election day is one, a legal resident of the United States, two, a resident of Montpelier, and it ties the definition of resident to 17 BSA section 2122 sub B. Uh, three has taken the voter's oath, and four is 18 years of age or older. Section 1502 provides that any non-citizen voter shall be placed on a separate supplemental voter registry held by the town or city clerk and that this registry shall be treated and maintained in the same manner as a voter checklist under 17 BSA chapter 43, subchapter two, which is the subchapter that deals with the state's voter checklists. Further provides that the city clerk shall develop all necessary forms and procedures for the implementation of the subchapter. Uh, and to highlight it, since we just brought it up, that was one of the points of discussion that came up the last time the committee met, was getting an idea of what the procedures that would need to be developed would be. Section 1503 provides that in any election involving federal, state, county, special district, or school district offices, or questions and city questions and offices that the clerk shall prepare and provide to any non-citizen voter a ballot that contains only the city questions. So on those election days where there are both local and then those other governmental offices up for election, only the city issues and offices will be voted on by non-citizens. Marcia has a question. Just, just remind me, what did we decide on justices of the peace? Are they included? They are not included because They're they are not. a constitutional office. Okay, thank you. Section 1504 provides definitions for use in this subchapter. First, the definition of legal resident in the United States means any non-citizen who resides in the U.S. on a permanent or indefinite basis in compliance with federal immigration laws. Second, non-citizen voter means any voter who registers and qualifies to vote in city elections under the first section we covered, section 1501, but is not a citizen of the United States. A non-citizen voter shall not be eligible to vote on any state or federal candidate or question by virtue of their registration under that first section. Jim has a question. Should that be clarified? Um, you, um, we just talked about justices of the peace, which is, I know it's in the Constitution, but I don't think we think of it as a state or federal candidate. Part of the discussion around JPs when it came up was that they are a constitutional office, okay. but they are vote, voted on locally. And um, at the time we discussed that, there was, the committee did not express a desire to clarify that JPs could not be voted on. It was assumed that because they are a constitutionally elected office, 
Yeah, yeah. no, I understand that. But I'm just, I was just reading this. Hey, they're not a state office. Uh, I'm wondering if it made sense for a constitutional officer of, of adding that. I, I'm just, listen, I'm just one little person over here in the corner. Right. Warren. In, in 1503, there's a somewhat more detailed list of the things they cannot vote on. And I just wonder if that federal, state, county, special district, or school district office or question, whether that language should also be in 1504 sub 2. Okay, I'm going to focus on that subdivision 2 where we're dealing with the definition of non-citizen voter is a bit duplicative of the prohibition in 1503. Oh, yeah. So if you were to add expressly constitutional offices or even more specifically justices of the peace to the list of prohibited mm -hmm. offices, I would suggest that it go in 1503. Mm -hmm. It states that a separate ballot shall be provided and then... Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty well understood as it is. Committee. So the final definition here is the Supplemental Voter Registry, and it is defined as a voter checklist populated by voters who qualify under Section 1501, but are not citizens of the United States. And it states that the checklist shall be held separate from any other voter list held or maintained by the city. This is a good point to bring up the other point of discussion that came up on March 27, and that is how these checklists will be accessed by the public, and whether there are any concerns that the posting of voter checklists or the access to those checklists would allow individuals to determine citizenship status of registered voters. So we had gone back and forth about this for a while, if you remember when we were chewing on this back the end of March, um, you know, concerns about uh, privacy and uh, safety of people who might be uh, separated out on the supplemental voter registry. And I think that is a lingering concern. Right. Um, though I, I think as far as posting it, we talked about potentially posting both lists together, not separately. So that it would be less obvious. Yeah, and that ties back to the first point of discussion where the committee, while kind of trying to suss out um, how these checklists would be either merged, separated, posted for public access, what the procedures that the clerk in the city was going to be adopting, and whether those procedures could somehow protect um, citizenship status. So that's why we invited the city of Montpelier to be with us today. So I don't know which one or both of you would like to come and be in the hot seat for a few minutes, but we would love to talk with you a little bit about sure. our concerns around the, uh, the privacy and security of the dozen or so people who might be on that supplemental checklist. It's not some bolts, it's probably be me. Yes. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Hello, John Odom, Oculator City Clerk, back again. Um, if I can just dive in, my, my um, vision for posting the checklist was to fully integrate them. Um, I mean, I'm, the discussion of justice and peace notwithstanding, I was been assuming the entire time that they would not be voted on since they are a state office um, in, in reality. And uh, so that entire, so you've got 
three elections, and two of them non-citizens would have no access to whatsoever. So there's just the one, just the town meeting day, and my assumption was, why well, I don't print the raw lists from the Secretary of State's website anyway. I dump them into my own system and sort them how I please. So I would, my intention was to integrate them so you couldn't tell the difference for, for the purposes of the city vote. Jim. You mentioned uh, it would only involve elections at town meeting day. Uh, last November, you voted on a couple of charter changes, including mm -hmm. this one. So is it your intent in the future when you're voting on charter changes that may be on the November ballot that they wouldn't be able to vote on? Well, first of all, by town meeting day, I should say any town election. Uh, secondly, that was called as a special election. It did not actually exist on the November ballot. It was a distinct ballot. Okay. Um, two the separate time, things. Right? They were at the same time, okay. doing, doing them concurrently saves us lots of money. <laughs> but they were distinct elections, and they had distinct ballots, and um, I would approach them the same way. So you can integrate the two checklists mm -hmm. for posting purposes. Sure. Yeah, that's no problem. OK. And so you just post those whenever yeah, one fewer there was a city election or question that both citizens and non-citizens could vote on. That's correct. JP and then Jim. I understand what you just said, sir, but I don't, I don't see that here that allows you to do that. Well, I because it says it's held separate from any, any other voter list, held or maintained by the city. They will be held and maintained separately. It's just for purpose of, of printout onto paper. But that's that printout on the paper is not where they're held. It's simply a uh, it's it's simply a product. It's simply a work product, essentially. And that gets posted. And that gets posted, yeah. So all the names under concern here are going to be posted on that one anyway. Yes. But it's not going to have the the, the uh, residency. Right. The difference would be I would be in a position if we did have a concurrent election town election like we did this last November, I would be stucking with, stucking, stuck with posting um, two copies of the checklist, which will be a tremendous use of paper, but it's not a problem for me. Jim and then Nelson. Yeah, I guess my, my concern would be more uh, for the state and whether or not, because you, you interchange your list with the state on a frequent basis. Mm -hmm. um, and they maintain the statewide database. I'm just um, curious of whether or not there's any issues uh, of the wrong one going to the state. No, in terms of distinct, I take that to the full, absolute sense of the word as far as I can. <laughs> they will be in distinct locations. They will be on distinct computers. They will be on entirely distinct platforms that don't mix unless I go out of my way to do some technological tricks and mix them. So they will be as um, completely separate. There's no opportunity for mixing them unless I were to approach it with, um, with intent. Nelson? I think that my, being the head of the party in my town, I used to be able to go and ask for a checklist mm -hmm. and print out a checklist and I get it. So in the, if I understand it correctly, you would have all names on that checklist whether they were citizen or not citizens to give to that party that requested? Well, it would be interesting. I'd have to be asking people, do you want a checklist for city elections or for non-city elections? And then I would provide one or the other, which is sort of an interesting extra question to add, but it then creates that separation in terms of what, what work product I, I deliver. But, it, but you, at that point, would make that decision and deliver based on what they're asking? Yes. So, given Nelson's question, if I just ask for both, and I've got the, I can cross-reference them and find out who the non-citizens are. Yes, you could. Okay. Any other questions, committee? John? In maintaining the um, supplemental voter registry, what information is that going to contain? 
well, it would uh, contain that information that is on the uh, voter registration form, uh, which is going to mirror a standard voter registration form, so name, address, birthday, place of birth, uh, the answers to the, the questions um, other than the, uh, you know, the verifying that you're a citizen. Um, now, I'm not sure how much leeway the law would allow. What I would like to do is craft a form that exactly mirrors that form, but then also asks them uh, to identify you know, what nation they're a citizen of, but that may or may not be appropriate. I was going to have that conversation, honestly, with Jesse Carpenter of uh, Tacoma Park, who I've really taken my cues from. Um, I have talked to her. <laughs> okay. They don't. They don't take any information from citizenship okay. for, for the concern that it may be abused. Well, I would defer to her. Because they're a sanctuary city as well, um, so they're very sensitive about you know, protecting their non-citizens. Well, I'm a data head, so I love to click that. <laughs> but, uh, but no, my intent was always to um, follow the good example of the Tacoma Park folks in every possible way that it, it lines up. Any other questions, committee? All right. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Committee, are we ready to act? Warren? I would move that we report favorably on H207. All right, we have a motion on the table. Jim, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to explain where I am. Um, I'm not going to be supporting this. Um, you know, as near as I can tell, uh, and based on the most recent information from Legislative Council, it looks like Local elections were required to be citizens back to 1864. So, if that's correct, uh, we're talking about reversing 150 years <coughs> of history. Um, I am very sensitive to um, what local voters uh, approved, and which is why we often routinely um, confirm and approve charter changes. However, um, I think, uh, especially working through some of the charters this year, I think one of the things we've always asked ourselves is, what are we doing for precedent? Uh, because the next town might have a different request, and if we've approved the change here, how do we say no to the next request? Um, for example, we've already got a proposal from Brattleboro to change the voting age locally to 16. Another town may be able to decide a different age. Um, how do we say no to that? How do we say no to a town that might want to um, allow non-residents to vote locally? Um, and what are the implications of doing that? <coughs> uh, so um, I also think, um, you know, while we need to be as welcoming as we can uh, to folks who are new to our country and new to our state, um, I think we should be doing things to encourage citizen, citizenship um, and not potentially discouraging it but providing some of the benefits of citizenship without having to get it. That's just me, um, and I recognize I'm only one voice on this panel. Um, we all make choices. If um, I were fortunate enough to own a home in two locations, I get to pick one that's my primary residence. I don't get to pick two, um, or the same way of different states. Um, I think the same is true of citizenships and the benefits of responsibilities that go with it. So again, I will be voting no on the proposed charter change. Committee discussion? Anybody else? Nelson? I think from what I've heard, this town, but others have been heard. I think I might have heard it on the floor. I don't know if I heard it here. But there are towns that voted for non residents and then they voted non residents out and said, So if this town so chooses, 
it could change their mind in the future if it proved to be a problem. I think the more people we can invite to vote, the better off we are. Uh, and when it comes to primary residence, primary residence is where you've been spending most of your life living, to me, more so than uh, whether you're a U.S. citizen or not. You should be given the rights of that area where you chose to live to represent your view. I do have a question for Tucker. Could, could give us the Reader's Digest version of what it does mean to be a primary residence? I think you referenced another statute that. That's you have it open over there. Um, the charter references 17 PSA section 2122B, and um, I don't have it. For the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council, we do define what it means to be a resident in 17 BSA 2122, um, subsection B. That subsection provides that a person can only have one residence at a given time, and it means a person who is domiciled in the town as evidenced by an intent to maintain a principal dwelling place there indefinitely and to return there temporarily absent. So that's the intent. But then it goes on to say that it has to be coupled with an act or acts consistent with that intent, such as having your home there, getting mail sent there, for example. So it's act, it's intent, and acts that uh, cons are consistent with that intent. How? I'm going to support this and. Uh, and the reason for it is because we're an evolving state in terms of our demographics. I represent Winooski, which is the most diverse city in Vermont, followed by Burlington, um, with 17% people of color, most of whom are foreign born. And I believe diversity is a business imperative and without our democracy being informed by all these diverse voices, we will eventually lose out. So times are changing, and I think to vote should be a right, not a privilege. And obtaining your citizenship is a process, and I think folks are on that path. But Without hearing the diverse voices that are in our communities that can inform our decisions to improve our communities. Bob? I'll support just because of the uh, person that lives two doors down from me who has been there for 30 years as a German citizen, is proud of her heritage, but wants to interact with her community more than just having had a job for 30 years and raised two kids and a productive member of the community. She wants to vote for the mayor. She wants to decide who is on the school board. She wants to participate in America without sacrificing her pride and her parents. That's not a leap for me. John? Um, I, I'm going to vote in support of this bill too. Um, you know, I've talked to a number of, of people that live in, in Wilmington, where I represent, um, who are non-citizens. Um, they're from various countries around the world, and they would love to be able to participate in w Wilmington elections and, and town meetings. And you know, I look at the language um, in Woodcock versus Bolster, which is one of the, the, the Supreme Court decisions, um, which upheld non-citizens being allowed. Um, to hold local office and to vote. And, 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 it, and it says, it has been the policy of our government to encourage immigration, immigration from abroad, and in early a period as may be, to extend to such immigrants all the rights of citizenship, that their feelings and interests may become identified with the government and the country. While awaiting the time when they can become entitled to the full rights of citizenship, it seems to us a wise policy in the legislature to allow them to participate in the affairs of these minor municipal corporations. 
I mean, I think rather than keeping people from becoming U.S. citizens, um, allowing non-citizens to vote will encourage them to participate to the fullest extent possible in our democracy and become U.S. citizens. around the history of non-citizen voting, if he would like to report this on the floor. <laughs> Sorry, Warren. His folder is, is a little thicker than yours, and I have a feeling he uh, is going to be quite prepared for any question that he might get on the floor. I suspect I would give the same answer, but he has the back of death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you see Betsy's email? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I thought it was 19, up till 1977. All right. So we have 10 minutes before we have uh, an opportunity yeah, to have an introduction to what a roadside DRE visit might look like for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of uh, experiencing one. <laughs> you really don't want that pleasure either. My other life. So is that what you found too, John? Uh, was that the no, I didn't know the answer oh, until. Oh, okay. Because I, I, I had found another story that said 77. No, I, I saw that story 77 in the but then. That's great. Yeah. So that's the end. Right. Put it on this one. Yeah. It was also the president of the Union Bank, who was the candidate at the Bank. So,
It's really terrible. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Supplemental. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go Basically, it actually looks like all the If you start yawning, you're going to kill Yeah, I talked to um, David Scher, and uh, Liz never comes out here. He's not here. started um, and I'm sure that Representative Hannon will join us momentarily. So thank you for being with us today. We, we have had a, um, in the course of talking about the um, cannabis bill have, have had a 
a great deal of conversation about uh, roadside sobriety, and I figured since we have um, someone with a fair amount of expertise just downstairs from us, we could um, have you explain to us what is the specialized training that a DRE goes through and what would a, what would a roadside um, test for impairment look like since I'm just making the assumption that none of us around this table have ever had the pleasure of having been evaluated in this way. <laughs> sure. So for the record, I'm Nader Hashim, representative out of Dummerston. Um, and also relevant to the record, I'm, I've been a Vermont State Trooper for a little over seven years, and I've been a drug recognition expert for about a year and a half now. And my, my idea of coming up here to testify is to provide you folks with the step-by-step -step process of what both the road officers go through and how it corresponds um, with what DREs do to, to help them out. So uh, just to provide you some quick background, I don't want to bore you or anything, but the DRE program was created in the 1970s with the LAPD and the National Highway Traffic Safety Association. And this was done due to an increased number of incidents in which people were impaired and they were crashing their cars but they were not um, obviously impaired by alcohol and so uh, this was developed as a systematic and standardized system uh, or process that is administered the same way to all subjects and it, it's administered the same way by all officers so I'll, I'll provide you with just how a typical traffic stop would go in which there would be a DUI drugs investigation. So let's say there's an officer who's not a DRE. Um, he pulls somebody over who... <coughs> I'm offering him up. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe. maybe. Just like a passive test, unlike some people think dexterity or... Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll find out shortly. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Can I be there for that? <laughs> So, so an officer pulls somebody over, let's say they're not staying in their lane or they forgot to use their turn signal, whatever the reason may be. This officer goes up and observes that this person has constricted pupils, um, their speech is slow and raspy, and they also see what we refer to as a law enforcement clue. They see a syringe on the side of the seat or on the floorboards. So that officer, through their conversation, can order this person out of their car if they have reasonable suspicion that they are impaired, order them out of the car, and have them perform uh, standardized field sobriety exercises. Um, this involves checking the eyes for nystagmus, and then it involves the one leg turn, I'm sorry, the, the walk and turn, and then the one leg stand. And I can break those down further for you if, if you'd like me to. And so, after this, what the officer will do is ask for a voluntary sample of the person's breath. And so, let's say this person had a beer earlier in the day, they'll blow maybe a 0 0.015, which is well below the legal limit of 0 0.08. However, this officer sees that this person is um, acting in such a way that they're, that they're impaired and that they're worried that they may have other drugs on board aside from alcohol. Because, you know, let's say this person failed the walk and turn, and, you know, they, let's say they, instead of taking nine steps, they took 20 steps, and they didn't count their steps out loud, which is, which is another clue. You know, there, there could be the reason to believe that this person is substantially more impaired than what somebody would be if they just had one beer, if that makes sense. And so, they administer the PBT. This officer thinks this person may be impaired on another drug. The DRE will typically meet this officer who will arrest this person at the police department or the barracks. And they'll perform the 12-step uh, process for the DRE evaluation. So the 12-step process, I'll just break it down for you. And just if you want to follow along, this process is, you, you can pretty much see it on this piece of paper that I handed out. This is what the DRE fills out every single time. It's the same piece of paper that they use. Um, and you know, this is part of the systematic and standardized approach. It's, it has to be the same way for each evaluation. So, so, so the first step is you have to get a breath sample. Um, that starts 
at the roadside where the arresting officer will get the breath sample, um, ideally. And then the DRE starts stepping in where they interview the arresting officer. And you know, it's at this point where the DRE takes into consideration what the arresting officer has seen. Um, but it's important to note that just because the arresting officer says, I think this person has been using heroin, that doesn't necessarily mean that the DRE is going to say, all right, well, you, you think he's using heroin, so that, that's probably what that means. So what the DRE has to do is determine what drug category this person might be impaired on. And so after the interview with the officer, the DRE will begin the preliminary exam, um, and this is where they take the first pulse um, to measure the person's pulse, and then begins the eye exam where you'll see a little bit more than half, a little less than halfway down, if you look to the center of the page, it'll say HGN, left eye, right eye. Um, you'll be checking for a lack of smooth pursuit. You'll be checking for nystagmus at maximum deviation. And you'll also be checking for uh, nystagmus at the angle of onset, which is prior to 45 degrees. And after that, you move on to the divided attention test, which will be uh, the modified Romberg, the walk and turn, the one leg stand, as well as the finger to nose test. And then you'll move on to, to checking the person's vital signs, so the blood pressure, you'll check their second pulse, and you'll also check their temperature. And you'll also, after that, you'll take them to a nearly totally dark room. It's not completely dark, but near total darkness. Um, and you'll check their eyes again. And you'll also, uh, check their oral and nasal cavities as well. And then from there, you will check their muscle tone. There are drug categories that will affect um, your muscle tone. So if you look at this um, indicators consistent with drug categories, you'll see about halfway down, um, you'll see different indicators or symptoms that are created when you ingest different drugs um, and how it will affect your muscle tone. After that, you'll check for injection sites, and then if the person waives their right to Miranda, um, you can get a statement from them. Um, after that, the DRE will form their opinion as to what drug category the person is impaired by. And it's also important to note that the DRE isn't there to say what specific drug in a drug category that person might be on. They're there to establish that a person is impaired by one out of the seven, or possibly multiple drug categories. So if somebody has been using heroin, the DRE would say this person is impaired by a narcotic analgesic, of which heroin is a drug category. And after that, the last step would be to would be the toxicology uh, test. And so the officer, the arresting officer, would um, either get would acquire blood voluntarily from the individual who was arrested or fill out a search warrant to obtain a sample of their blood to be used as an evidentiary sample. And that would that would conclude the DRE process. Typically it lasts, it, it really depends on who the officer is and who the DRE is, but the 12-step the process lasts maybe 40 to 45 minutes. It also depends on what sort of statements are being Acquired, and so you know, if somebody wants to talk for a long time, you're you're going to listen to them, and you know, you'll have a longer period. But you know, when you take into consideration the time of the stop, all the way to the time of taking the person to the hospital and then bringing them back, you're looking at about three to four hours, and this is a process that will take usually at least two officers to um, to wrap up. Now, what I'm what I've been thinking about a lot of is the is the saliva test that we've been thinking of um, incorporating into the tax and regulate bill. One of the, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. I'm not really sure what direction to go in with how I feel about the saliva testing as somebody who's um, performed these car stops on the roadside. You know, the, when, when I've talked to my colleagues recently about this, you know, the main feeling is, please don't create any more work for us. You know, it's, they, they think 
we officers feel that you know we are able to do these evaluations without a saliva test but to incorporate the saliva test on top of already having a blood test that's just that is creating more work especially if there is the affidavit part uh, this this expedited affidavit uh, being attached to it the the general consensus is make it either a saliva test or a blood test let's we, we don't need to necessarily have both the, the the other on the other side of that it's possible that making folks aware that the police have a saliva test as a tool in their toolbox could be a deterrent because I'm sure there are people out there who think that if they smoke marijuana and then in an hour or so get behind the wheel nobody can tell but that's that's not the case we, we can tell and so but if they might be deterred from doing that if they're aware that the police have a test in which they can check for the presence of cannabis and the other concern that I would have is that the saliva test doesn't check for impairment it checks for the presence of these metabolites um, can we try to do with a couple absolutely. questions? Sure. Uh, Rob, Marsha, and then. Okay, I, I actually have a couple of questions. One, um, can you walk back through brief, briefly the sequence of events that, did I hear you say that a person could actually be under arrest and then the DRE is brought in to the picture? Yes, if, if the person is impaired, so if, if an officer has probable cause that an operator is impaired, they'll be arrested and then they'll be brought back to the police department and then put through the evaluation. Okay. And then just to touch on the saliva strips, um, couldn't it also be looked at by using the saliva strips that it could show that somebody doesn't have anything on board um, fairly quickly and that might make the interaction and the process substantially shorter? Um, for instance, I notice here, you know, one of the questions is, you know, are you on insulin? And I know folks that are diabetic that, depending on your sugar level, can react differently at different times. And yeah. So yeah, that, that is, that, that's a valid, that's a good question. You know, one of the things that the DREs do is rule out uh, medical, um, medical issues as the cause for impairment. So, if you actually look at the very bottom of the drug influence evaluation sheet, you'll see that right underneath no impairment, it'll show medical. And so if somebody, I mean, to answer your question, yes. Yeah, the answer to your question is yes. But also DREs do play a role in determining if somebody's actually experiencing a medical issue as opposed to being impaired by drugs. But you know, I don't want to divert from your question, which is could the saliva strip show that somebody has no drugs in their system? Um, I suppose, yeah, that, that is possible, but there are also drugs that metabolize very quickly. Inhalants uh, come to mind. And so I don't know, I don't know enough about the saliva test itself because I've never used one or you know, really read in depth about the different saliva tests. So I don't know how it would pick up on drugs that could have metabolized already but caused somebody to have been impaired. Um, and inhalants come to mind because those metabolize very, very quickly. Uh, where did you receive your training? The training was performed in Burlington, and the, the training is the, the first, the preschool for DRE training is 16 hours, and then the basic school for training, I believe, is 56 hours, followed by between, I, th I think it was 40 to 60 hours in Arizona. Um, at the Maricopa County Jail, where we go through um, field certification. I can I ask one more question? Um, is the blood test considered to be more comprehensive? So if someone has a blood test, that test will say what types of um, drugs may be in that person's system? Yes, uh, a blood test is is very comprehensive. Um, what 
you would do with the blood test, um, you know, prior to sending the request up. I mean, you have several pages of all the different drugs and the different panels that you can choose to test. And what the drug test will show you are the different levels of metabolites. So you can trace back, um, depending on what the drug is, you know, how much of a drug is present in a person's system. If you get what I mean when I say trace back, so you know, depending on how many metabolites of a certain drug there are present in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is that considered to be more comprehensive than a saliva test? I, I would say yes, but I haven't used a saliva test, I so I can't that. really speak to the saliva testing itself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Jim? So you mentioned um, deterrent, um, and I suspect in your experience as a state trooper that you occasionally parked your car somewhere um, with a radar gun or just parked your car there and probably noticed a change in the average speed going by. Absolutely. Um, and I, I would suspect that if you could disappear tomorrow from your, that location, that because you were there yesterday that that might continue on that the speed limit went down a little bit. So arguably occasionally use of the car in a location is a deterrent. Um, and I'm, I, I guess I would have to think that I don't understand all the science of a saliva test and it mean, certainly is not the be all end all, but if it were a deterrent to some people might that not help um, with traffic situations? I think if it were an effective deterrent, it absolutely could help. The, but on the other hand, we have we already have preliminary breath tests for alcohol, and that's not a deterrent for people driving under the influence of alcohol. It is for me. So, well, well, we, we have, we do have a lot of, that's for you, maybe, but there, there's a lot of people who still drink and drive. Well, I know, I mean, but the fact, yeah. And I know alcohol is a little bit more cut and dry. Yeah. Um, but not that I, I drink anything, but I won't have more than two drinks if I'm at an event. The, the risk is too high. So it's, it's, it's definitely a term. Good. Good to know. How? Uh, what's the average amount of time to process? blood test from start to results? Uh, it takes, you'll probably get the blood results back um, typically a week, I want to oh. say. Um, you, you can ask to have it sooner. Sometimes it takes a bit longer than a week. Um, but if it's, let's say, a fatal car crash, you, I mean, you can just reach out to the lab and ask if they could hurry it up. And typically they'll, they won't say no. So, could a saliva test be used to, instead of like find someone that is impaired, could it, could it be a test to show that someone isn't impaired? So for example, you know, as we get to the end of the session, I sometimes drive home at 2 in the morning, um, or 1 in the morning, you know, I'm trying to get home quickly because I prefer to be home. I get stopped by the state police. I haven't been drinking or smoking or anything, and they give me a saliva test and it shows no cannabis, no nothing in my system. Mm -hmm. Could it be used slowly to rule out impairment? I have to be careful on saying that it rules out impairment. Um, it rules out that you don't have drugs in your system. system. The, I mean, frankly, I. Uh, you, you have to be a brand new cop, a rookie in all respect of the word, to think that somebody who's tired is impaired if you actually look at the totality of the circumstances. Because, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, we're, we're talking to the person when we pull them over. We're, we're able to smell their breath. We're able to look at their eyes. I mean, typically I can tell if somebody is, has something on board within 30 seconds to a minute of pulling them over, if not sooner. It, the, 
when you look at somebody's eyes, that's after a few years of doing this, you, you recognize that the second you look at somebody's eyes, the size of their pupils, um, whether there's red and conjunctiva, uh, you, you'll, you'll know. Or at least you'll have a firm idea as to how you should proceed. Uh, but to get back to your question, I don't want to avoid that. The, uh, it won't show that you're not impaired. It will show that you have no presence of drugs in your system, which could expedite the process. Yes. Similar to what uh, you had mentioned earlier. Nelson? I, I understand the blood test takes a, a long time. The saliva test is in, instant? Is that what I'm hearing? You give them a saliva test and you can tell at that time, or do you have to send that away? I'm, I'd, I'd have to speculate, but I believe that it would be instant. I mean, I mean, like I said, I've never actually used one or seen one in action anywhere, but I, I do believe they're instant, as in a yes or no to the presence. So the chemical presence shows it is. Yes. Rob? Um, can you mind? Even with a blood test, though, that doesn't demonstrate that there's impairment, right? It just confirms that there's drugs on board, but because there's one no established thresholds as to what would be an impairment or not. Isn't that really about the same as with a saliva strip? Is it? I guess you could quantify with blood tests, you know, how many well, nanograms of the THC you have, but yet it still doesn't speak to whether there's impairment or not, does it? That you're you're correct in that it provides a quantitative assessment. Uh, yes, you're correct. Another thing I wanted to point out. Uh, something that was in the uh, miscellaneous transportation bill was creating the opportunity for EMTs to go to police departments to draw blood for the conclusion of these DRE evaluations and that was that that's really wonderful and awesome and the reason I say that is because the most frustrating part or the most difficult part of the DRE evaluation is when you get to the toxicology, because that will oftentimes require writing a warrant, calling a judge, calling the state's attorney, typically in the middle of the night, and then after that, calling a judge, and then getting your warrant approved, and then you have to take the individual who's been arrested, you take them to the hospital, which is seemingly always busy, and then you have to ask these nurses, you know, please draw this person's blood while you're in the middle of you know, dealing with all that you're dealing with. You draw the blood after being at the hospital for an hour or two, and then you drive the person back to your barracks, and then you can release them to a sober party. However, with this new provision in the transportation bill, which I'm a strong supporter of, instead of going back and forth to the hospital and tying up resources there, you can have EMTs come to the barracks or, or the police department, draw blood there, and then the EMTs can leave, and you have your sample right there. You don't have to drag the operator to and from and it would cut down the time of the process substantially. So that's something I'm a strong supporter of, and it, it'll definitely help out the process. So I just want you all to be aware of that. How? So how would you process a person who um, is taking medical marijuana and they're stopped, but they have it in their system because they're under treatment? So, so the, the reason that somebody would get stopped and screen for DUI is if they are a hazard and a risk to other operators on the road. I mean, if they're operating negligently, then they're not using the medical marijuana in a way that is safe for other people. Because I'm not opposed to medical marijuana at all, but if you're using it right before driving and you're unable to stay in your lane, then you're endangering other people and yourself on the road, and that would be a DUI drug investigation. And same thing if, um, if you're taking Vicodin because you had a surgery and it affects you in such a way that you're unable to safely drive your car, that, that is a DUI drug case, and it would be investigated as such. I mean, it, I mean, like I said, if you take this Vicodin and it affects you in such a way that 
you're driving into oncoming traffic, that's mm -hmm. your you are a hazard to yourself and other people on the road. But if they had a, a tail light out and you pull them over and I mean, is there any way to differentiate that this that, yeah, that's what I'm oh, sorry, uh, finish No no no, just you know, but they go through the entire process if because if, if you're using a blood test, it just detects it's in your system, but not impairment. Yeah, that's what the um, that's what the first step of the process, uh, or rather, that's what the officer who will pull that person over. That's what they're going through on the roadside um, at the first stage mm -hmm. of this. They're determining if this person is impaired by putting them through the standardized field sobriety tests, okay. which you know they're they are administered the same way for every person. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that, and so if the officer is able to conclude that this person is impaired, then they'll be taken mm -hmm. through the remainder of the process. But you, you have to show that, you know, having a tail light out is an impairment. But failing all the field sobriety tests, that, that is an indicator that the person is impaired. Having a tail light out is not impairment, and I think that um, I've heard a great deal of concern that um, the unrestricted use of a saliva test could end up uh, with people who have a tail light out getting uh, a saliva test and and showing a positive result if they used last night or over the weekend. Um, so just kind of curious at where in where in the steps of the field sobriety test do you actually make that judgment call and is that made only by DRE or um, or are there um, rank and file troopers who are not DRE trained who who would be able to make that evaluation that someone was impaired can you uh, clarify your question. I'm not 100% sure. Where in in the steps of this process um, do you become certain that somebody is impaired? After by by substances as opposed to just being sleepy on the way home from a long week of work. So the officer who makes the first the, who makes the car stop. Mm -hmm. If they have reason to believe that a person might be impaired, mm -hmm. then they would put them through the field sobriety tests, of which there are three. And then after that, they make the determination. Uh, and then they'll also provide the preliminary breath test. And if the person's below zeros or well below a zero 08, which is the legal limit for alcohol, and if the officer still thinks that this person is impaired by a drug, and they have probable cause to believe that, then they will make that arrest. And that's when the DRA is coming. Correct. Oft oftentimes they're called in the middle of it, but yeah. Nelson and then Jim. The actual saliva test wouldn't be done until the part where you've done the breathalyzer. So there's a whole process that's done to see if the person's impaired or not initially. And then at that point, when they think they're impaired, is when they would do the saliva test for. Correct. I mean, that, that's how I would proceed. Yeah, yeah see, because yeah. at that point, if they don't think they're impaired in any way from driving and the rest, if I understand it correctly, they tell them to get their tail light fixed and they go away. Yes. And the process is ended at that point versus uh, when you do a slab test, it shows up that you've had something in, in your system, which could have taken a month ago, some of that stuff. Uh, you don't haul them in and arrest them for impaired if he isn't impaired. Just because the test showed showed that he had, uh, on his saliva test, showed that he had a drug in his system, but nowhere else did it show that he was impaired when he did the test. Yes, I, I think, I'm not, so you're- You've gone through the, yeah. the whole test. Nothing shows he's impaired. Yeah. A saliva test was in, administered by somebody. Mm -hmm. It shows that he has a drug in his system. At that point, is he arrested for being impaired? Or not? You, know, you, you need 
you need probable cause that somebody is impaired. And if you have zero clues on the field tests, then you know, then you, you, you can't arrest this person if there is if there are no clues of impairment. Because you have to be the, as the statute reads, you have to be impaired to the slightest degree. And if there is no impairment whatsoever, then I, I, I don't see how you'd be able to well, arrest let that. Let me word it a different way. No impairment is shown up. Do you still go along with the breathalyzer <laughs> test or the saliva test if, if everything is shown he's not impaired to the test which is done? I, I don't do that. If, if I pull somebody over and they've gone through the field sobriety tests with flying colors and I have no reason to think that they're impaired on anything, I'm not going to ask them for preliminary breath tests. John. So um, somebody asked me this question this afternoon um, about saliva testing. Um, if you if you were to take a saliva test, what do you do with this sample after it's been tested? I I would have no idea. Okay. Uh, that's not, that's not. I mean, what? So. So so like, are you asking? I mean, the state. So I guess my have follow up to that is, it could yeah. later be used to grab your DNA. I don't think. I don't. I, I can't really speak to that. That's something that's. Because, you, you know, I've done a test with Ancestry.com and you spit into a little thing and from your saliva they were able to figure out your DNA. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I'm, it, no, I, I can't really speak to that. Um, okay. That would be, you know, what we would do with that, I, I don't really know. And I can't speak specifically on behalf of the state police or any other police agency right. as to how they would store information or a sample I mean that's in their own rules and regulations um, yeah so I, I can't really speak to that so let's come back to um, what a DRE does and what that test for roadside impairment looks like is there anything else that you wanted to walk us through in terms of understanding the training that you've had or the process that you would use to evaluate someone for impairment. I mean, you know, what I'll tell you is that as police officers and DREs, we, we're looking at the totality of the circumstances. Um, we have to take in all the information that we have, you know, everything from the way the person was driving to the field sobriety tests and you know, things that we might see inside of their vehicle as well. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've, I did go over the uh, training that we go through. Um, it's, it's in Burlington. We also do the field certifications in Arizona. And I think the state has a little over 60 DREs now. Is that sound about right? Uh, 56. 56 DREs right now. Um, they're... You know, I, in my opinion, I think one of the things that we could do to help um, roadside safety is have more DREs on the road. Um, I think that you know, getting this process done quicker and more effectively um, with, I mean, I, 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 get, I still get phone calls to go to DRE requests in St. Johnsbury, and I'm in Dummerston. And so, <laughs> you know, there, there's, we're few and far between and it's a very good program that's being run in Vermont. And I'm not just saying that because the person who runs it is sitting here, but it, it is a good program. <laughs> and, and it's, uh, I think having more DREs out there would be a start. Um, again, I'm on the fence about the saliva testing because I think about being on the roadside. I mean, DRE, DUI drug cases are some of the most stressful cases to have as a typical road police officer. You know, it's, you know that you're going to be involved in this for hours, you know it's going to involve needles and drawing blood and writing warrants. And, I mean, if, if you want to stress out your sergeant, just get a few, get two DUI drug cases in one shift when it's a light shift and it's, people get stressed out is what I'm trying to say. But it's, 
Now, I think having more DREs on the road would be helpful. Um, like I said, I'm still on the fence about the saliva testing and whether or not having this, that, that's actually another thing that I wanted to discuss is this expedited affidavit or expedited search warrant for saliva testing. Um, I've asked around what that means and nobody, nobody really knows what it means to do an expedited warrant on the side of the road before administering a saliva test. Uh, so th those are my thoughts there. I don't know if anybody has any questions after that. <clears throat> Nelson. I have a question. You said there was, if I, I heard earlier in testimony that there was about 300 state troopers in the state. I think and if you're saying, and you're saying 56 are trained in this, are they located, at, spread out across the state so that they're easily can get to the southern end from the northern end, or are they clustered more in the middle with a heavy population? So, for, so for your question, um, the first part, it's not just troopers who are DREs. There are DREs in other police departments. And ideally, um, they are spread out throughout the state and at, at different police departments. Yes. So they're not centralized or anything like that. Bob? How many points in this process, even in new sections, does the individual have the opportunity to opt out? Opt out? Yeah, you, you pull somebody over for straddling the lane or something, you've already got a violation, and then you start to pick up information, where do they have the option to say, no, thanks, I'm not <coughs> and then you, I assume you ask the the way to do with the DUI. So it would, I mean, it's hard to speak on, I mean, you have the opportunities to say no to different things. You, you don't have to waive your Miranda and you do not have to participate in the DRE process. Um, I forgot to mention that earlier. So, you know, when, after somebody gets arrested, brought back to a police department, as a DRE, I go into the processing room. I, I ask this person, I, I introduce myself and I make it clear that I'm here as, as an impartial observer and I'm going to make the determination, I'm going to form an opinion as to whether or not you're impaired by drugs or which drug category you might be impaired by. And then I'm going to report that decision to the officer who arrested you. And then after I explain that to the person the, who's been arrested, I ask them if they want to waive their Miranda rights and talk to me. They say yes or no. Oftentimes they say no. And then we move to the DRE process. I explain what it is. And then they say yes to that. I, I explain that they have the option. I've never figured out why they don't want to waive Miranda, but they will go through the DRE process, but that's the thing that happens. But yes, they do have essentially two options to opt out during the DRE process. And then based on the arresting officer's information, you may escalate it up. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Call state's attorney and ask for an order. Uh, yes, I, I, you have to, you, well, you need probable cause to yeah. get a search warrant, and if you have probable cause, then you can write the warrant and then draw the one. Is it Bob? Yes. Marsha? How effective would you say the DRE testing is? I'd say it's, I have the exact number written down, I think it's somewhere around 92% effective. Right. That, I, I, I think that it's, it, it's effective. Um, it's not perfect, and it's, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's not perfect, but it is effective. And, you know, after the training that I've been through, I'm confident in my ability to, if I were to put somebody through this 12-step process, to make a confident opinion about what drug category that person uh, may be impaired by. Thank you. Rob? Um, a couple things. One, it sounds like the state's made quite an investment in you for DRE, among other things. Do you have any idea what what the cost is to the state to get you up to, to speed to be a, a DRE? And secondly, what kind of annual training or certification do you need to go through the state program? I don't know the cost to create one DRE. Um, I know that uh, Sergeant Riggin might know that. Um, the 
and your question was what annual training do I have to go to? Well, once a year we have, I believe it's an eight hour training that we have to attend. Would you like to direct your question to the sergeant? Well, sure. If you could identify yourself for the record, if you have the ability to answer. I'm Captain them. Gary Scott, the state police. So uh, that's federally funded through a grant for training, so it goes through a grant process. So it doesn't cost the state. But so do we have any idea what it would cost to get we'd to? Have to yeah, we'd have to get back to you. We don't have it offhand. And would every law enforcement officer, let's say from this point going forward, that was going to be trained to be a DR, DRE, would it be federally funded? I'm sure that will run out at some point. <laughs> All good things. It's, it's also it would be tough to make every single cop in this state a DRE. Oh they, yeah, it requires yeah. a certain type to go into it. Yeah, but it certainly sounds like we need more and strategically placed as well. But, yeah, thank you, Jim, did you have a question? No. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't want to belabor the deterrent, but some we've heard that some areas, provinces, maybe states have gone to zero tolerance for drug limit. Now, I don't know if that's good, bad, because um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're impaired. If they are stopped and they got anything, they're in violation. I just you know, for something like THC or something. What I'm just curious what your Thoughts would be on that. On having zero tolerance? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so if, if somebody, it, it, the, the issue is that every single person is different. And, you know, somebody who smoked a joint in the morning decides, you know, 24 hours later they feel fine, but it's still freshly in their system and they decide to drive somewhere, they're, they're going to work. Would that person fall into the zero tolerance category? That that would be my concern. But then also the question is going back to the actual law of DUI itself is are they impaired to the slightest degree? That's that's the question. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that. Lots of questions. How? So if this tax and regulate bill goes forward and becomes the law have a retail cannabis market. How many more dairies do you think we might need to do proper roadside intervention? I can't I can't really I can't tell you. Not because I don't want to, I just I don't really know. Um, that might be something that Sergeant Riggan could speak to or the captain. You but can punt that to the commissioner you can be the one Okay. Yeah. Sorry I can't be more help. <laughs> A lot more. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Absolutely. That was Thank very you. helpful. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Jim, you left out. He didn't. Uh, he didn't make you stand and. Touch your nose. I've seen the guy I can do it. <laughs> I've seen him dance. There's no way he can pass your nose. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That wasn't called for. See if he dances with you again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So, committee, you have uh, you have 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Although, if um, do we know where Michelle is? Has she been in contact with you at all? She was going to try to come Great during our yeah. 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 Understand it right now. You, okay. Yeah. He's identifying Michelle. We um we had talked in concept about uh, continuing our walkthrough of the bill during the breaks, um, but I suspect if she's out and busy, that it would be a few minutes before she could get here. So. Yes? Oh. Okay. So, uh, committee, you have a 20 minute break. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, thank you for being with us this afternoon. It's great to be back.
We um, have been working our way through the um, language in S54, Cannabis Consumer Protection and Regulation. So uh, the request was made that we hear from public safety. Well, that's very kind of you. And here you are. So I will give you the floor. Okay, so I had, uh, I wasn't quite sure what your, uh, the focus of your questions were going to be, or the focus of what you wanted me to talk about. So I sort of prepared two different uh, tax. One was just sort of the, my views of the wisdom of the, uh, the tax and regulate bill. Uh, the second was sort of what the impacts would be to DPS should a tax and regulate bill uh, pass out of the legislature. So if you want to give me some guidance on what you'd like to hear from me, I'm happy to try to uh, oblige you. The second one, oh, second. Number two, there. Okay. So. Uh, I tried to break this down into um, um, sort of, you know, what I would see would be the impacts to DPS in the event of a tax and regulate bill. And I tried to break that down into three categories. One was the cost of drug recognition experts, uh, what we might see in, in that area. The second was uh, the cost that would be associated with reducing the black market for marijuana, which I think would be a key component to the success of any tax and regulate um, scheme. And then the third was just uh, the cost for um, testing. I, I am a firm believer that if, if we're gonna go down this tax and regulate uh, avenue, even without it, that uh, we need a better testing mechanism for, uh, for drug impaired driving. And I've been supporting the Salada Bill both last year and again this year, which I think is, uh, I'm not sure which committee that is in front of right now, maybe judiciary. Uh, but the cost associated should that bill uh, pass and the impact that might have on DPS. So taking those uh, one at a time, uh, the, Mar the Governor's Marijuana Commission did look at the DRE issue uh, fairly uh, extensively as to whether the number of DREs was appropriate in the state at this time, and if we had a taxing rate, what, what the additional DRE resources might need, it to, be, might need to be. So we concluded that um, the number of DREs we have in the state right now, which fluctuates somewhere between 50, 55 and 58, I don't have the exact number right now, uh, is about correct. I mean, right now, we, we don't think we need additional DREs within the state. We think we've got it covered pretty well. Um, but we're keeping, you know, the conclusion of the Marijuana Commission, which we would need to keep a very close eye on that if we, we were to fully legalize marijuana. And we are keeping our eye on it now that you know, small amounts of marijuana are legalized as to whether additional DRE resources would be needed in the state. But right now, at least from DPS's standpoint, and after you know, conversing with others around the state, we thought the number was about right right now. Uh, but that's one we're keeping a close eye on. Um, the cost of the DRE program in Vermont right now is about $300,000 a year, which includes training, equipment, and overtime for call-outs. Um, that, is, that is paid for right now by, by NHTSA, by the National uh, Highway Traffic Safety Administration through a grant from the Governor's Highway Safety Program. Um, so that is basically covered with federal money, which is, you know, it's been fairly consistent, fairly steady over the years, but it's federal money, you're never quite sure what's going to happen. Jim. Is that 300000 just the training cost, or is that the cost of uh, these individuals hanging out at the uh, police station? Uh, no, so that's, I'll get to that in a minute. There's some hidden costs here, but that's, that's the cost of training equipment and, and overtime call-outs for the, for the DRE program. So each DRE that's going out, maybe on an overtime, maybe getting overtime, depending on geographically where they're at. Um, they could be going out on whether they're on shift or off shift, um, whether they're current DRE that's on call, it could be an overtime situation. So that does not include um, other costs associated with the department on the, uh, for the DRE. So that's just the, that's just the straight cost for the DRE. Mike? Um, just to clarify for me, so yeah, not part of that system. So that someone's a DRA is something they do in addition to their regular services, right? It's not something they focus on exclusively. No, it's a collateral duty. So, and there are DREs that are in state police. There are DREs that are in uh, the local police departments. And I, I assume everybody here knows what a DRE is. I didn't. I didn't fall back on what you know what a drug recognition expert Not is and what they do. Funds. Okay. And so, um, as to what they do and what, what they are. So, um, but it is it is a collateral duty for um, for troopers. It's a collateral duty for um, you know the local PDs that are that are DREs. They go through a fairly extensive training. I'm sure you covered it much better than I can as to what that training entails and, and uh, what it involves. But ultimately, it's an expert. It's an expert opinion given in court 
about whether somebody is impaired or not impaired. It's not objective evidence. It's, a, it's, a, it's an opinion by a, somebody that's been specially trained, um, and that's, that's what it is that goes to me, how they testify. Um, so the, I just want to, I do want to point out that the $300,000, that doesn't, um, it doesn't, it, it's not sufficient to cover all the components of the DRE program. Um, state and local police agencies bear significant co costs in certifying, maintaining, and deploying DREs, except when deployed on overtime. Um, in addition, when a DRE is deployed, agencies occur additional costs in backfilling the positions, if it's a shift, if they're on shift at the time, uh, vacated by a DRE. And we did an analysis of the state police budget, and we estimated that our costs are approximately between $28,000 and $70,000 a year um, in additional costs that we incur in supplying DREs um, statewide. It's difficult to estimate these costs across the state. It wasn't something I, I, I tried to do because I'm not sure it would be uh, fruitful in, in coming to that conclusion. Uh, but the state, the local municipalities and local departments have those same costs. So for example, if a DRE goes out that's on shift and is going to be out for three or four or five hours, oftentimes we'll have to call in a back, you know, somebody in on overtime to cover that DREs uh, that's now vacated their normal shift, their normal shift work. And I think that occurs both at the local level also. So that's sort of a hidden cost, it's, it's a, and it's not easy to calculate what that is, but it's, a, it's an additional cost. We calculated it out as I say between 28 and about $70,000 um, each, each year. Um, Bob has a question. Yeah. So are you sharing? Is this a, a communal poll of DREs for yes. town and state? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I mean, maybe, uh, but maybe cost, a better understanding of that. But there are, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole scheduling system where a DRE will be on call and will be, be reporting out. We did have issues initially, I think, of having enough DREs to be able to handle all the calls. So we had, you know, uh, suspected dr drug driving cars. We just didn't have an available DRE to go out there. So if somebody from Burlington needs one, the VSP supplies one, you have to backfill. Who picks up that tab? Well, I, I, that will just come out. I'll just pay for that. It's, a, it's either an overtime cost to me okay. coming out of my general fund budget. Um, and I'm sure for the locals, it's probably the same. Same reason, but it is a it's a it's a mutual aid type of, of uh, system where we're the DREs there's a number of DREs and we just sort of figure out who's going where and what the schedule is going to be to cover wherever it needs to be covered. So, um, so they say you know it's it's all federally funded. I mean federally funds can be um, there's no guarantee they're going to continue at this level and there's no guarantee they're going to continue indefinitely. Um, and it's also I think it's reasonable to question whether the, the federal government is going to um, continue to fund any DRE program, and I haven't checked other states now that have legalized marijuana, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility that the federal government will say, if you have legalized marijuana, and we are no longer going to fund your DRE program. Um, I don't think that's beyond the, the, uh, the, realm, of the realm of possibility. You know. Marsha? But it's still illegal under federal law. So it's, you know. oh, wouldn't we need this program to anyway? To determine if someone is driving under the influence of some other type of drug, an opioid, or oh, absolutely. I mean, if we lost the federal funding, I mean, I'm sure I'd be not banging your door down to, come, to give me general fund money to fund this program. I mean, I'm confident that this would be a significant public safety issue if, you know, tomorrow they were to pull the nits of money and say we're no longer going to fund your DRE program or we're funding it to the end of the end of this fiscal year. I, you know, I'm confident I'd be banging your door down to say you can't let this program. Um, just you know, wither on the vine and die. Um, yes. Um, and to your knowledge, is there any data about the uh, people that have been um, arrested under this program and what specific drugs were in their system? Um, I I don't have that data off the top of my head. No, I'm, I'm trying to think whether that's data we could collect and get for you. Um, it might, it might be, you know, the number of DREs that were deployed, um, the number of DREs, you know, whether we then, there was a blood test that followed that, that we then had a, a, quanti a qualitative and quantitative analysis of what the drugs were. I, I don't know that. So Thank it you. may not happen all the time where you've got a DRE that gives an opinion and then we're also getting a, a warrant. I don't think that happens, um, except in maybe fatals and or significant bodily injury uh, cases. Maybe you, maybe you know the answer to that. Yeah, I can chime in if that's okay. Um, there, there is data that's available. Uh, it's kind of like an update as to um, you know what drugs were present. 
um, and how many people were pulled over and the the presence of the metabolites like what like was it over five nanograms or under five nanograms for cannabis for example mm -hmm. uh, I can go through my email and uh, dredge that up for you and send it to the committee if that's something that you'd like Send me a link. But, but I'm correct that we don't do that in every, I mean, it's not every single test, every single DUI that we pull over on a, and use a DRE and then we're getting a blood to say. Um, for the, at least in Wyndham County where we, we do, the state's attorney says that, you know, if you're pulling somebody over and it's a DUI drugs case, you'll either apply for a warrant to get blood or you'll do it voluntarily. Um, that's how it is in Windsor as well, so it is it is up to the discretion of the state's attorneys. But from what I've heard, it's generally common knowledge that you will be getting a sample of the person's blood, whether through a warrant or voluntarily. I can check that, okay, you. What, you know, what the other, what happens statewide on that on that issue? Which gets us into the whole blood testing and getting a warrant, which is a separate, you know, kind of use a separate issue. Um, so anyway, that, that's, um, I think Rob has a question. That, that's all I got on the DRA unless there's a question. Well, I do have, do you, can you, do you have a rough idea what it costs to get a patrol officer up to the DRE skill level? That I'm, I'm confident I can get you that number. I don't have it in my breakdown of, you know, cost per officer to get them through the training. Do you have a rough idea what it would be? I, I don't. I mean, I'd be guessing. No. Um, but I, I'm confident I can get that. I, I just have gross numbers as to what we, we spend each year. Bob, did you have a question? Not on DREs, if we're ranging. We, we are, I think we're ready to proceed to so item you, number two. You hit on um, my particular area of interest in your introduction. Yeah. Um, the legitimate market does not succeed or does not succeed as well as if there's a secondary market to retain. Um, it, it seems like you'd be enforcing that now. You just mentioned more money to combat that which is puzzling and I'd like you to expand on, but what plans do you have to enhance enforcement so that the secondary market gets eliminated? From? Okay, so uh, I'm happy to segue into that. So, I mean, most of the pro-marijuana legalization advocates claim that, you know, when you legalize marijuana, you're going to eliminate, through a tax and regulate scheme, you're going to eliminate the black market. I mean, that has been patently shown to be false in every state that's legalized it. Um, you know, Colorado is a thriving black market. Um, Washington has a thriving black market. Uh, in Colorado, from 2016 to 2017, there were 480 felony arrests for illegal marijuana-related offenses. There were over 10 tons of illegal marijuana that was seized and over 8,500 marijuana edibles that were seized. Uh, in 2017, illegal Colorado marijuana was destined for 24 other states. So this idea that the black market goes away when you magically uh, legalize marijuana is patently false. Um, so, so when I look at it, in order for a tax and regulate scheme to be effective, safe, and profitable, um, the black market needs to be eliminated or its effects reduced to a negligent, you know, de a negligent degree. And I look at that, there's two ways you can, comp you can accomplish that. It's either through market forces, that the legal marijuana is either better marijuana, it's priced, it's, it's at a better price point, and you, you let market forces drive the black market out. Um, or you have uh, robust enforcement of the, of the regulations and the laws surrounding um, the legal market, which then is an enforcement issue to drive the black market out through robust enforcement. Or you have a combination of those two, um, of those two things. Um, with respect to the market forces driving out, that has not been the experience in the, in the states that have legalized it so far. So, um, you know, I think in order to eliminate the black market through enforcement, you have criminal investigations, you can use prosecutions, you can use civil penalties, you can have regulatory penalties, you can have uh, barring violators from entering, being in the market, should they be found to have been in violation of the market. You can use forfeiture uh, tools to forfeit property that's used or intended to be used to vi uh, violate the tax and regulate laws for, for marijuana. Uh, but without robust enforcement, um, like other states that have legalized, I, I think you'll have a legal market in Vermont and you'll have an illegal market in Vermont. I think that's what the evidence seems to show in the states that have um, legalized it. You know, right now we don't have sufficient uh, enforcement resources across the state to, to investigate and combat the illegal opioid market. Um, so we, we are stretched thin on and just doing that. And frankly, that poses a far greater threat to uh, Vermonters than a black market marijuana uh, would. Um, 
you know, marijuana is, in, like alcohol, has been identified as a so-called gateway drug. Um, it's typically used before a person progresses to more harmful substances. Um, and that's from, that's from the National Institute of Drugs. Um, so I, you know, I, I think any tax and regulate scheme is going to have to have appropriate planning for enhanced law enforcement. Its ability to combat combat what I think will be coming an illegal market or a, a, a continuing illegal market uh, within the in, in, in Vermont. So I look at it. You're going to have to create a unit. I mean, I, I you know when I thought about this, you'd have to create a unit somewhat similar to you have for liquor control, where you have people enforcing the laws with, with respect to liquor control whether it's regulatory enforcement or, or criminal enforcement uh, regarding that. How big that unit would be, I'm, I'm sort of guessing at that. Uh, right now there are 12 within the, there are 12 inspectors in the enforcement division of the liquor control. I think you'd be looking at least doubling that. You know, where that would live, you know, whether it lives under DPS or lives under a separate uh, agency or whatever, you know, I think this is creating some sort of board or some sort of, you know, where that would live, I don't know. But I think you're looking at potentially doubling the size of what we have in liquor control inspectors now to be marijuana control inspectors, for lack of a better word. And it could be more than that. I mean, I'm really kind of guessing at those uh, those numbers. Mike has a yeah. question. Yeah. At some point, I'd like to if you could flesh out those numbers because users of alcohol and users of marijuana, there's a wide disparity there. Yet you're saying you think we're going to need twice as many. For marijuana is alcohol. Well, what I'm saying is, if you're going to create a tax and regulate scheme, you have to have the ability. If you're going to, if you, if you, you don't have to have any. You wouldn't have to have any. I mean, if you just want to let the let the let the market take care of the market and the black market flourishes, the black market flourishes. flourishes. If the goal is to get rid of the black market, you're going to have to step up enforcement on the enforcement end, in, either in the regulatory end or the, or the criminal end, to try to, to make it so hard to conduct a black market that you don't want to do it. Um, but you don't have to do that. I, you know, what I'm trying to say is if, you, if, if, if your, your goal is to eliminate the black market, because that's what makes your tax and regulate scheme successful, there's going to have to be some increase in the number of uh, enforcement officers, whether they're regulatory enforcers or whether they're criminal enforcers, uh, to do that. And I, I, I really don't know what that number is. I mean, it's hard to tell you know, what, that, what that number would, would be. I just thought you're probably looking at doubling the size of what we have right now which is 12 liquor inspectors, um, they're now going to be shifted to going to be marijuana inspectors or marijuana enforcers or whatever, whatever, we, want to, whatever we want to call them. Um, I did break down some numbers. So the cost of hiring 12 new sworn members in the state police is approximately $2.2 million a year, uh, with a total three-year cost of approximately $4.8 million. If you are going to be serious about eliminating the black market um, under a tax and regulate scheme, that's sort of my best estimate on that and it really you know, I caution it is strictly an estimate I, I wish I could give you more solid numbers on it but we're kind of going down you know unch we're in uncharted water waters right now sure enough uh, how do you know what other states are doing in terms of I, I know there has been additional law, law enforcement in those states I can probably get you Colorado's and Washington's what the, the uptick they've had in law enforcement in, in trying to enforce this uh, you know, enforce their tax and regulate scheme. I could probably find that out. I don't have that with me right now. Bob? So this is something that's currently illegal. What are we investing in it now, specifically? Uh, well, that's, I think that's sort of the irony to me. It's like, you know, we don't really enforce, you know, have robust enforcement of the marijuana laws uh, in, in the state. Um, you know, we don't, I, I don't think we arrest that often for marijuana violations. I certainly, can't think of the last trafficking case the task force has done on the marijuana trafficking case. So the irony of this is like, you know, we have not, I think, had robust enforcement of the marijuana laws for some time now. And now we would be shifting to a much more robust enforcement uh, of marijuana laws because if you're in a tax and regulate, in order to make that successful, you have to take some steps, I think, to eliminate this black market, which in my view is will, will, will exist. Well, I think we agree. I just, and I'm not talking about the individual user so much as growing in the state do we actively pursue that I, 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 I can't tell you when the last marijuana trafficking case we did with one of the task force number one I think when we prioritize you know drug drug enforcement in the state I mean, in the throes of this heroin epidemic we are focused you know we are devoting our resources toward that 
And then just sort of the general, I think, uh, the general displeasure in us, you know, enforcing marijuana laws, arresting people for marijuana violations. I just don't think that's an area that we focus on that. I mean, I can get to the statistics, but I can't, since I've been Commissioner of Public Safety, I can't remember a case where the task force has been out arresting somebody for, you know, selling marijuana or growing marijuana or anything like that. We may have done it, but I just don't, I don't recall any cases like that. We've just been focused on the, you know, the heroin, uh, the heroin epidemic almost exclusively right now. JP? Commissioner, I just want to verify what you said. Um, if you had to put on additional troopers to, to combat the enforcement of marijuana, should it become, like, should it become law? You mentioned a $2.2 .2 million figure, I think. Yes. Now, how many troopers was that going to get you? I said, the, so my breakdown was the cost of hiring 12 new sworn members, troopers. 12, okay. Uh, would be approximately $2.2 .2 million a year. Uh, in year one, with a total three-year cost of approximately four point eight million. And you think you could do it with another additional well? As I said, I mean, I'm giving Again, my best it's estimate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I, that's my best. That's my best estimate. Is it twelve? Is it fifteen? Is it ten? Is it eight? I mean, I just, you know, I'm just trying to give you. I thought a reasonable way to look at it was we have twelve liquor inspectors right now, right. and I, I would think at least it's safe to say we probably have to double that number if we're going, if we're going to be talking about. Uh, you know, enforcing the same type of, of regulations and probably more regulations than, right. with respect to marijuana. So and, and and maybe I'll, I could be wildly wrong. Maybe it's six. Maybe it's you know I could be wildly wrong. But I think I think that's not a it's not an unprincipled way that I came up with that you know with that number. Right. I'm sure I'm sure sir that you had some data to help you come up with that figure. But now you also mentioned that you believe at this point you have sufficient number of DREs. And again, just so I understand clearly, is that at the current use that the ERES are needed right now, or should this tax and regulate become law? You don't think you need to put on more detail? No, I, I'm not saying that. I mean, it, what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to say is we think we have enough right now. You know, right. We've, been, we've been closely monitoring since legalization last July to see whether we're, we're pinched. And the way we see that is, you know, we, we don't have enough DREs to get out to every stop that when a police officer says, I'd like a DRE to come out to this, right. out to this stop. And so we're monitoring that carefully. Do I think we're going to need more DREs when if we go to a tax and regulate scheme? Yes. I just can't put a number on that right now. So it's one I just the, 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 I thought the better way to do it was sort of monitor it and see, you know, see where we're at and, and see if we can't figure that out as we as we go along to add trainings um, and the number of DREs that, that, that we have at down in the state. So that that's the approach I've taken for better or worse. Okay, because I was just trying to clarify if you're your additional uh, dozen new troopers, would they, would they all be DREs? Maybe. You know, maybe, maybe not. Okay. All right. Thank you. But that's, so that's what I had, that's what I had on the, uh, you know, sort of the impact I thought to go down the tax and regulate the market. The other was just, I had, I, I had broken down costs of in-state testing for, you know, if we should get saliva testing, if that bill should pass, which I think is fundamentally I think uh, the health commissioner said it would be unconscionable for that for that law to pass without prevention and education being part of it. I would echo that and say it would be unconscionable to pass a tax and regulate bill without a better way to test for impaired driving in the state of Vermont. I, you know, I would echo what the, the health commissioner said on that. And I think saliva testing, there's a lot of misinformation about what saliva testing is, how it works, um, and you know, I think that is probably the best mechanism in which objective evidence, and I'm not talking about an opinion, I'm talking about objective evidence, can be presented to a jury as to whether somebody had a drug in their system or didn't have a drug in their system. So, um, and you know, I can leave the saliva bill for another day, but I did break down the costs of doing that should a saliva bill or an oral fluid testing bill pass. So I have that as numbers if you if you want to like those. Yeah. So would you imagine the saliva test replacing the blood test? Um, in most cases, yes, but not, not entirely. It may still be blood and fatal accidents, or when somebody's unconscious, obviously, um, or in serious bodily injury cases. I, I, I haven't thought that through, but I think in those cases, there may still be some time where you would want uh, to take blood. But in the, in the vast majority of DUI cases that are just sort of run-of-the-mill DUI cases, I think it would replace, it would certainly replace blood in, 
in those situations, which is far more intrusive than saliva, far more intrusive mm -hmm. uh, from, from a Fourth Amendment standpoint than, than saliva. Mm -hmm. So I have, I did sort of, the cost of doing that, um, we would estimate would be between, um, Our startup cost would be somewhere between 290000 and 393000 And the breakdown of that, if you're interested, is we have about 100 instruments. That would cost about 265000 to 368000 There are cartridges that we deal with. These cartridges are about $20,000. And then training materials about five five thousand. So the startup, that would be our startup cost. Our annual, we anticipated, and this is from the lab, who's going to use these numbers. The reoccurring cost would be about $60,000 a year, um, not including personnel time, but that would be for uh, equipment, um, would be for replacement cartridges that you'd have to replace every year, and then ongoing training materials and supplies. That, that would be the breakdown of that. So those numbers were uh, 290 to 390 in startup costs and about $60,000 a year in ongoing costs. Um, So that's, that, that would be the breakdown on sort of impacts that I see at DPS, you know, personnel-wise, financial-wise, that would be, that we would incur in connection with um, the uh, attacks and regulate system. And, so, and, I, and I haven't really got into just sort of what would be the, the increased, you know, road safety issues. Um, I, I can't really put a dollar in the Questions? Questions for the commissioner? Jim. So, first of all, it sounds like you support saliva testing. Yes. Um, are there any alternative saliva testing that we should consider? Alternatives to saliva testing? Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm, well, I don't know of any as I sit here now that would give us, um, I don't know of any. I mean, obviously blood, we have that, we have that ability now right. to, 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 to get blood. Um, but I don't know of any other okay. less intrusive or very unintrusive way to collect what I think is objective evidence of, okay. of, of drug use. Earlier you mentioned that um, the states that have gone to a tax and regulate model still have a black market. Yes. Um, do you have any information that suggests it's the black market is the same as before tax and regulate, decreased or increased? I'm just trying to get my arm around, you know, if, if, are we increasing the consumption of marijuana or is it just shifting, you know, the black market to the legal market? I, I, you know, I, I don't have those specific studies as to whether, you know, you had a, a, the same black market and increased black market. Um, but I, you know, my, my understanding is the whole goal of this and one of the things the proponents are arguing repeatedly is you will get rid of the black market. That's one of the, 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 the pillars of why we should legalize marijuana. It would eliminate the black market, it would control the type of marijuana they have, it would improve safety of the marijuana, that that's a core pillar of why we are doing this. Um, so I don't have, um, you know, whether it increased or decreased the black market, but I'm not sure it, it matters. Nelson? Uh, as you know, we legalized medical marijuana in the state, and it's been used. In the, have you seen an increase in the, any uh, of your uh, criminal activities due to the legalizing of that? Um, well, People I, I, driving and et cetera? Well, I, I did have some statistics on that. Uh, yeah, I do have some statistics on that. <coughs> So, um, uh, in Vermont, marijuana was decriminalized in 2013. In the three-year period uh, pre and post decriminalization, there were 20. There was a 28% increase for all motor vehicle crashes, where at least one driver tested positive for marijuana. For crashes resulting in a fatality, the increase was over 30%. Um, AOST statistics for 2018, which came out in early earlier this year. Uh, revealed that 68 people lost their lives in fatal motor vehicle crashes in 2018. This compares to 70 in 2017 and 64 in 2016. To me, a particularly disturbing trend for the past two years is that by more than a two to one margin, 
fatal crashes involving a driver suspected of driving under the influence of only drugs has eclipsed the number of drivers impaired by alcohol. So that's two, by a two to one margin. Um, the driver suspected of driving under the influence of drugs has eclipsed the number of drivers impaired by alcohol. Equally disturbing is that 23 of the 68 fatalities last year, over one third, involved drivers impaired by drugs alone or a combination of drugs and alcohol. Um, just to repeat that, over one third of the fatalities in Vermont's highways last year involved drivers impaired by drugs alone or a combination of drugs and alcohol. Of these 23 drug impaired or drug and alcohol impaired fatalities, 65% of the drivers tested positive for Delta 9 THC, the main psychoactive eating ingredient in marijuana. You know, maybe that's coincidence, but maybe to me, it's maybe it's a wake-up call. Are you done? JP? Commissioner, what was that figure on the uh, PHC? I'm sorry? What was the figure on the under the influence of THC? So in the, um, of the 23 drug-impaired and alcohol-impaired fatalities last year, 65% um, of the drivers tested positive for Delta-9 THC. So 23 of the 60, 68 involved uh, drugs or drugs and alcohol. Any other questions for the commissioner? Sure. Would you like to house this new agency? You know, I haven't looked at it, you know, probably as carefully as I as I have. I thought it was sort of a standalone agency. It didn't look to me it was falling under anybody, but uh, but I can't say that I, I, I've read it all that carefully. Well, the health department doesn't want it, so. <laughs> I, I, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought it was sort of a standalone, you know, not under anybody. It just was this kind of a new, a new department or a new agency that was gonna, gonna get stood up. Uh, you know, I was, I was a minority of one. <laughs> I was willing to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, still trying to figure out how we ended up with the marijuana registry, but that's. Uh, you know, that's I, I do that's have. A, I have a real question. Oh, you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's unusual. It's <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, but I lost that one. So, um, your agency does the medical. Test, yes. And one of the things that was very impressive to me um, was how you track every plant and your folks have access to that and follow it from cradle to grave yeah exactly um, would you envision um, such a system for a um, recreational field um, and, and uh, I don't have any idea what you do for a software but you know, I think in a perfect world, yes. I mean, I'd have to talk to Jeff Wallen, who does the, you know, whether from a practical standpoint, that's even within the realm of possibility, or what, you know, the cost may be prohibitive of doing that. I just, I hesitate to give you an answer on that. I mean, in theory, that sounds like the right thing to do. Well, you but, mentioned black market. I mean, if you stop someone and they had marijuana on them, you can perhaps find out right then and there whether it was uh, from a legitimate seller or or uh, black market. Yeah, I have to give that a little bit of thought. Because if I just had a bag of leaves and I don't have the stem or whatever they're, however they're marking the, the plant, I'm not, I'm just not sure how that whole thing works. I mean, I'd have to get Jeff Wallen to either explain that to you or explain it to me, because I'm not entirely sure how the whole thing works. But in theory, that sounds yeah, good. You know, whether, uh, many things in theory sound good, but are, you know, in practicality can't, are unworkable. Nelson? What would be your recommendation? To have this as a standalone organization or have it under I think I'll take a pass on that one. I just, I'm not sure I'm, I have enough information to give you a, a considered answer on that. Any other questions for the commissioner? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Again, real soon. Right, anytime. So, committee, we're going to shift gears for just a moment and um, talk about the modular charter change before we pass it in. Because I have uh, some information.
information from Betsy Ann that, oh no, I don't have some information from Betsy Ann. John has some information from Betsy Ann. Um, so maybe you'd like to. Sure. Uh, I, I discussed with Betsy Ann and Will the supplemental voter checklist and how having the separate lists that only identified non-citizens, you know, could be easily grabbed by someone. Um, so they have a proposed amendment which would basically create a city voter checklist. So that would include citizens and non-citizens on the list. It would be for just Montpelier local elections together, but it would make it more difficult for someone to grab a list of non-citizens. They still could prepare that city or local list against the general election list, but it would be a lot trickier. Um, you'd have to comb through it to actually identify non-citizens. Um, so that's one modification um, they suggested. The other modification um, that they did is just to make it clear that um, Justice of the Peace, um, you know, can't. I know that was your idea, Jim. <laughs> I, I listened. <laughs> Nelson? How many voters are we talking about in this town when we're making the change? We don't we don't know. I don't mean non citizens. How many in total? Oh, total right total, total voters. We have over six I think around six thousand or something. And you're talking twelve of them. Yeah. I think that covers it. Anybody wants to go through that many names to pick out right. half a dozen people, right? Great. Mm -hmm. So this basically just puts uh, some structure and requirement around what we talked about with the clerk in concept mm -hmm. uh, requires it. Jim? I think those changes make sense. I'm still not supporting. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think they make sense. And I would support amending that. So maybe a motion to reconsider our previous. Put up the language just Yes, so. you should put up the language. And is Betsy Ann able to come up? I have not heard back from her yet. All right. Um, all right, I'll Did she send us to? Yeah, I can forward it to everyone. Kelly, could you shoot Betsy Ann an email and ask her? If I she already did. did. Okay. Just haven't heard. Why would we have to reconsider our vote? We could just con we could consider an amendment. Unless you want to do a strike off before. Well, I don't think she worded this as a strike off, but we can take a look at it. This will be in your email momentarily. Good. And I just send it to you too, Kelly. Oh, I'll post it. Is it up there? Or is that do you have it on the page? Um, no. It'll be up in one moment. Might be faster. Well, if your iPad is there, you could call it up on your email, and then that might be faster than waiting for yep. to upload. Mm -hmm. What's it listed as? It's not, it's not posted yet. It'll be up. She's oh. fast, but she's not <laughs> quite that fast. You've been kind of pushing. Today. Just today. Oh, buddy. <laughs> Nobody's just brought me this. Well, it's like you recognize. Maybe the freshman should be up. John Gannon, potential H207 amendment. Ready. 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 There's a, yeah, there should be a bill with highlighting it. Um. Possible amendment. But she's on her way. All right. Well, she's not going to use this anyhow. She has to use her own. She'll have it all set up mm -hmm. and ready to plug in as soon as she gets here. She's just that. Uh, yes, 
we are going to uh, continue. We're going to look at revenue estimates. How how many of you are planning to go to the services tomorrow? Just the two of you. So the agenda that's posted is good. Well, it doesn't have any detail to it. Betsy Ann, you can jump right into the hot seat. Thank you for crafting some language that, uh, as we just looked at it with uh, with John, and we haven't seen it up on screen yet, um, looks to put a little bit of structure around what we had talked about conceptually with the Montpelier City Clerk with respect to how to treat the voter checklist to ensure the security of the dozen or more or fewer non-citizen voters. So please share with us what you've crafted. Sure, for the record, Betsy Ann Rascal, Legislative Council. Um, as I was listening earlier to the testimony of a city clerk, it seemed that um, some of the testimony was that the plan was to implement the law in a manner that the language might not completely support. For example, the idea of having the supplementary voter, supplemental voter registry, I believe the quote was, I'm, I'm coming from a different committee and I have my notes right in front of me, but uh, that it would be kept as like a work product um, that wouldn't be um, made public, but it's still a public document because anything produced or acquired in the course of a public entity's business is a public document. Um, so hearing your concerns about having just a list of people who are non-citizen legal residents, um, I heard that as a concern and the plan for implementation didn't seem matched the language exactly. So I spoke with the director of elections about it and got together with Tucker at the direction of the vice chair to potentially come up with some language to help better reflect what I thought, what we thought we heard the committee want to do, which was essentially just have a checklist of the voters that can vote at a city election. Because you're defining who can vote as a city election as the current voters under current election law and then adding on to that list the people who are non-citizen legal residents. So those would be the people that are entitled to vote in city elections. And so our idea was to clean up this language and instead of having a supplemental registry containing just the non-resident or non citizen legal residents to just require the city to maintain a city checklist to be used in solely city elections. So this is what we came up with as a draft strike all for you to consider if you do want to go that route to clean up the language. What I've done here is this is an annotated version which shows in red strike through what language from the bill is introduced will be eliminated and then adding in yellow highlighting language that could be added. So here, under this language, the first thing that would change is this subchapter title. Instead of having a supplemental voting registry, have a subchapter just entitled City Voter Checklist for all the people who are eligible to vote in city elections. It would start off still the section about the eligibility of non-citizen voters. Um, we discussed the language under the current um, bill is introduced, it started off by saying in addition to our current voting qualification standards statute, a person can vote if they're a legal resident and meets all these other requirements that are already in statute. Um, we are thinking to rephrase it as is provided in H408 regarding 16 and 17 year olds <laughs> voting in local elections to say notwithstanding 17 BSA 2121A1, which is the specific provision of law that says you have to be a US citizen to register to vote. So notwithstanding that specific subdivision, a person may register to vote in Montpelier city elections who on election day, just like our 2121 already says, is a legal resident of the United States, so long as that person otherwise meets the qualifications of 17 BSA chapter 43, which is our chapter of election law that provides voting qualification standards. And this is a similar language to what's in H408. So notwithstanding the US citizenship requirement, a person can register if you're a legal resident. And that's still a defined term, unchanged as it was in the bill is introduced. But you have to meet the other qualifications, which are 
you're a resident of the city, you've taken the oath, and you're 18 years of age or older, don't need to say that because the rest of Chapter 43 applies, which includes that definition of what it means to be a resident, for example. Here in this subsection B that's proposed, the language that says a non-citizen voter shall not be eligible to vote on any state or federal candidate or question by virtue of registration under this section. This is just cutting and pasting from the language of the definition of non-citizen voter. You can see here on the last page, under the definition section, um, that second section would be a second sentence would be struck. Um, non-citizen voter is not eligible to vote on any state or federal candidate or question by virtue of registration, but under section 1501 now. A couple reasons we did this. One, to maintain the definition of non-citizen voter, it would be only be used in that section 1501. Also, we try to avoid not making uh, substantive statements in a definition section. Leave a definition section what it's supposed to be doing, defining a term. So that's just a cutting and pasting of that second sentence up there. Put it into this 1501 about the eligibility of non-citizen voters. Maintaining that, that clarity that a non-citizen voter is not eligible to vote in state or federal um, elections by virtue of their registration for city elections. Then in section 1502, instead of having this language about a supplemental voter registry, I'm um, just calling it a city voter checklist, going back to that same concept that these are the people who could vote in a city election. So this would be entitled a city voter checklist. The city clerk would still have duties to maintain it. Um, striking out from this section 1502 the language saying that a non-citizen voter is placed on a separate supplemental voter registry held by the city clerk um, and that it's treated and maintained in the same manner as a voter checklist. Instead, saying that the city clerk shall maintain a city voter checklist comprised of voters eligible to vote in city elections under 17 BSA Chapter 43, which are our standard current law uh, election qualifications language, and this subchapter, meaning this new city election subchapter, which includes those non-citizen legal residents, and just requiring the city clerk to keep this city voter checklist separate from any other voter checklist. So that, for example, in practice, when you have a city election, that would be the voter checklist that's posted. That would be the checklist that's used for city elections. For our general elections, our primary elections, there would be a separate checklist that does not contain the non-citizen legal residents. Maintaining this last sentence that the city clerk has to develop all necessary forms and procedures to implement this subchapter. Still, the city would have to figure out how to maintain these separate checklists, how to populate them, etc. Here in section 1503, this city election ballot, we maintained all of the existing language and just getting rid of the non-citizen voter reference um, because this is just discussing that this is just going to be a city election ballot for those people who are eligible to vote in the city elections. We did add at the bottom of the page, except for Justice of the Peace, to acknowledge that Justice of the Peace are constitutional officers that are subject to voting qualifications citizenship. Warren has a question. So, so what ballot do the Choices for Justice of the Peace appear on? Well, they would, they are to be voted on by our Constitution at the general election. We discussed this, discussed this with the Director of Elections. They would likely be either on their own freestanding ballot, just the Justice of the Peace ballot, um, but that, and only the people who could vote at the general election could get that ballot, right? It's possible that those Justice of the Peace candidates would be on the back of the rest of the general election ballot, which sometimes happens in some towns. But the Secretary of State's office prepares general election ballots that includes the Justice of the Peace candidates. Bob? So does, so you maintain a city list. Does anybody have the ability to query a clerk? I mean, we talked about this in the context of statewide mm -hmm. uh, security of ballots and lists. Does anybody have the ability to say, tell me the people who are eligible to vote for tax office and get that list? Absolutely. There are 
three kinds of checklists that a town has to include or has to have. There is the one that's required by our current election law to be publicly posted in a several different places around the town, including the town clerk's office. Um, it helps that helps to know if you're registered to vote, for example, in the city election. That's required by law to be posted. It would still be posted um, under this language because it's your city election checklist. There's also the entrance checklist that gets used when people check in to vote. Um, and then there's the municipalities portion of the statewide checklist, but that probably wouldn't apply here um, because that is for each town to help build the statewide voter checklist of people who are eligible to vote in general elections. So I don't think this checklist would populate the statewide voter checklist. Big picture, um, yes, people can request this city checklist. And currently, there is protection in our statewide voter checklist statute providing that public officials cannot give a copy of the statewide voter checklist to the federal government or to a foreign government. It's probably not captured here with this new city election checklist um, due to the current language of the statewide voter checklist statute. However, that's something that you could possibly address, um, for example, in your miscellaneous elections corrections bill if you wanted to um, add local checklists to that same protection. Did I answer your question fully? Well, yeah, that's, that I thought is the problem that we were trying to address to some degree, to a greater degree. Yeah. A lot. Depends but upon it. which of us you were referring yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Warren and then John. I'm still bothered by the justices of the peace idea. We vote, we vote for justice of the peace on town meeting day. I don't believe so. Representative Kitz Miller, let me look up the. Every two years. It's in November. It's by the Constitution. They're required to be voted on at the same time as your other uh, constitutional officers. Oh, well, that makes it easy then. So if I'm, if I'm wrong, then that makes it easy. Let me show you. I believe you. <laughs> in our town, the town meeting is when they start, when they first do their first. Yes. Sure. Here we are. Yeah. Biennial elections, Justice of the Peace. It's Chapter 2, Section 43. They have to be voted on at the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November at the general election. We're almost there. Okay, I just want to make sure. Huh. Okay. Good. I was wrong. <laughs> so, um, would you like to ask a question? I would, thank you. Sure we had another reading last night, and all the different protocols, I guess. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sorry. Um, so there's nothing to preclude. I know there's an issue that a lot of people seem to have about the feds gaining access to this voter checklist. And you said there's laws on the books, which I know there is, that prohibit the town clerk or town clerk's office, or whatever, from releasing a checklist to the feds uh, of, with these names. But it doesn't preclude them from getting that list from somebody else. Uh, this average Joe citizen could they go into the town clerk and say, "Can I get a copy of the voter checklist?" And they may have to pay a fee for it, or ten bucks or something, or whatever. Put it on, put it up, give it to them. Uh, and right, they can do that. Correct. And I'm pulling up the statute just so I want to confirm before I answer. Okay. Um, so we, let's look at the language together. So this is the statewide voter checklist statute, 17 BSA 2154. <coughs> Last session, the General Assembly added this B2 language to say that a public agency cannot knowingly disclose a copy of the statewide voter checklist or a municipality's portion of it to a foreign government or a federal agency. Um, for these three purposes, it's limited to these, these three purposes, registering a voter, publicly disclosing their info, or comparing their info to another checklist. And then, any person who wants to get a copy of the statewide voter checklist under sub C, 
has to swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that they won't knowingly disclose the checklist to a foreign government or a federal agency or to a person acting on behalf of one um, in circumvention of the prohibited purposes for using the checklist. So. Okay, that's good. So, so they have made reasonable efforts to ensure for the confidentiality of that so that when, when, when average Joe, Joe uh, voter comes in and gets a copy, he can't just arbitrarily give it to his good buddy who works for ICE or, or something on that line. But something I want to definitely highlight here is under this Montpelier City Charter language, you're adding on to the qualifications of who can vote. And so as I understand it from speaking with the director of elections, the city of Montpelier can't use their, under this bill, the whole new city checklist, which includes our current law voters, but also our non-citizen voters, cannot use that to populate the statewide voter checklist, because the statewide voter checklist is supposed to represent who can vote in our general elections. Right. So under this bill, I do think that um, that protection in the statewide voter checklist statute is not going to apply to this language for this Montpelier City city checklist under the current language of the statewide voter checklist statute. However, I think it's possible, and I've sp we've spoken with the director of elections about it, if you want to apply that same protection to this new city checklist, you can amend the statewide voter checklist statute to make it clear that also any city or town checklist can also not be provided to a foreign government or the federal government. But I think you'd have to make an amendment to this statute to make that crystal clear. Uh, that also sounds reasonable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I think the direction of elections said that would be a fairly simple, a straightforward amendment, mm -hmm. and yes. one we could probably make in our miscellaneous elections bill. Yes. yes. I think the language would just be in B2 here. Instead of saying municipalities portion of the statewide voter checklist, it would just say or municipal checklist. Something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Jim? We could talk about it under miscellaneous, but I, it seems to me we asked the clerks that question whether or not they wanted specific language last year when we did that other bill, and they were ambivalent about it. Maybe wrong, but it was another bill I didn't support, so. I'm just a negative person. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> Yeah. All right, just the last thing to mention, we've already addressed the definition section and removing that affirmative statement out of the definition of non-citizen voter and just moving it up, cutting and pasting it up above into section 1501, and then eliminating as unnecessary this supplemental voter registry since that would go away. There wouldn't be a supplemental voter registry, it would just be the straight up city checklist. Questions for Betsy Ann? So before we knew that you were creating this nifty little strike all amendment, we uh, we took action on the bill. So I'm just looking for a little procedural advice on what we should do to message our action to the clerk's office. I think you need someone needs to move to reconsider your form your previous vote. What is the threshold to reconsider? Is it a majority vote? Does anybody have a Mason? I don't, have I don't think anybody's going to object to that. <laughs> so I think it'd be a move to reconsider, a yes or no, and then if the motion carries, then you'd just be back um, okay. instead of doing a favorable vote. Move instead. I, vote. I would move we reconsider our earlier vote so you can proceed with the strike call. You can't move because you voted as negative. No. no. I can't. Well, this is just saying. This is submitting. <laughs> 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 really? Yeah. Just push me down. You know? <laughs> Step on <laughs> I think he was grinding some salt. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, <laughs>
I used to you, think you were You're already friend. down and bloody, and he's just really? draining salt in it. Oh um, so, committee, uh, just let's do a show of hands. All those in favor of reconsideration of our earlier action. Um, that's a unanimous. So, John, what motion would you like to make? I move um, to approve H207 as amended um, draft number 1.1. And just and be, to clarify it, uh, it's actually draft 1.2 because this is the annotated version and then oh. a clean copy just gets rid of all the annotations and I can show you that here a second. Okay. So this is the draft 1.2 with all of the annotations incorporated. Okay, so I move to approve H207 as amended in draft 1.2. Discussion? Go ahead. Gannon? Yes. Kitzmiller? Yes. Rowicki? Yes. LeClaire? No. Harrison? No. Gardner? Yes. Classic? No. Hooper? Yes. Brownell? Yes. Colston? Yes. Copeland Hansis? Yes. Oh my God, the vote cannot be Nothing changed. Oh my God. All that good work, but you <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Thank you.